I mean, this is this is a contrast. This look, Glenn versus Joke. Let me just show <laughs> you. I mean, I mean, what else has happened? Oh, actually, no. You should change your picture to Indiana Jones because there's breaking news that I will cover when we record. Because I've only found out like 20 minutes ago, and it is a bit fucking distressing. Oh, well, not distressing, oh. but it's a bit annoying. If you wanted to spend your evening with Indiana Jones in preparation for the game, but I will, yeah, I will allude to it if you've got an Indiana Jones picture. <laughs> well, I've got, do you know what? I'll do something better. Hang on. Uh... Because this is what I want to talk to you about as well. Yeah, different um, thing. Yeah. What uh, did you let's want to see. talk to Uncle Connor about? Uh, oh, this is. Oh, uh, Connor, do the intro while I search for this image. Okay. Heh, heh, howdy, guys. I don't know what that was. Um, yeah, hello, Pacey Sheep. But from the couch edition, um, yeah. Um, we haven't got any cameras this week. There's technical and placement difficulties in the studio, so we've had to do it from isolation, a la 2020 days. So, you know, this is just going to be an audio-only, Jack, judging by our lovely profile pictures on StreamYard, which is our very reliable and safe site. Um, so reliable. Yeah. Jokes on you, I guess. Ha, ha, ha. Why are they all fucking web files? Fuck off. I want a JPEG. Oh no, that's, that's a compensation continued from last week. <laughs> Hashtag where's the JPEG? A fucking WebP file. Who, fucking anyone out there who knows who invented the WebP file, give me his address. Oh, a JPEG. This one I'll have to do. PC talk, like computer talk, <laughs> Google image talk. Google image my anus. Yes, welcome back to Nerd Bubble Podcast. Well, for the first time, where, as Connor said, we are not in the same room for once. Um, purely off the fact that um, something came up for me yesterday. I, I basically I got given a free football ticket, and I text Connor in the morning, and I was like, ah, 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 and that's what I said to him. And he went, "Are you having a stroke?" <laughs> and then um, <laughs> now we're here. But, um, yeah. Oh, Connor, why don't I remember how to do anything? What the fuck? What's wrong with me? All right, delete delete Glenn Powell as much problem. as I hate. Bye, Glenn. Oh God, that was horrible. Oh, boo. Hashtag right, Glenn Powell. Right, this is I, I, this I is know. this is my segue into what I want to talk to you about this week. Are you ready? Fine. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Still spinning. Oh my word. <laughs> Oh no! Hang on, <laughs> I should have gone as the other thing, not not the clown. The clown should be next week. <laughs> well, there's a Damn certain it. clown. Well, he's a clown. The the man that we want to talk about, isn't it? Really? Well, yeah, but a real life muck man, if you want to say, but doomtish. <laughs> and that's because Stone Stone Cold said so. Look Austin. at me, Connor. Oh, I know my. WWE things. You do know, so you do know WWE things. Shall we talk? So, anyone who hasn't um, seen Netflix's new doc, because there's a lot of good documentary or documentary type drama things on Netflix. They're always really fucking good at that. I mean, I've fallen asleep, God knows how many times, trying to watch the fucking um, Lyle and Eric Menendez story. Um, <laughs> so, um, Lars watched about six episodes. I've watched about one and a half just because I fucking like she, she watches it at like half nine and I'm in, I'm laying in bed and then I'm too comfy. And then I wake up and it's like half twelve and she's still watching it. And I'm like, I just there's no point. Wow. By, by that hour. Time. Yeah. Literally. So now I'm like, but what I did when Mr. McMahon dropped on Netflix, because I saw it on the coming soon for a while. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> there he is, the prick. <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Anyone who knows this podcast knows that Connor is a WWE and wrestling fan in general, and I have always been sort of oblivious to like you know wrestling things and people. I know actors that were wrestlers. That's probably been that's my main knowledge. Media, you know. yeah. yeah. Um. But when um, Mr. McMahon dropped all oh, was it six episodes on Netflix? It was only six, but it did feel a lot more. Well, it felt a lot more. I would have said eight or nine personally, but yeah, yeah. six. Because we, yeah, we had a bit of a, you know, a, we've had a turbulent week at home. So like Wednesday, I sort of I watched it before I went into work, and then ended up having to leave work, and then I sort of like watched it that night, and then into 
the next morning, not like overnight, but like and then the next morning, I picked up like the last episode and a half. So in the space of twenty four hours, I'd watched all six episodes. That's even better. That's even <laughs> fucking better. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, I had to change it. Yeah, and as someone who, like I said, I've never really been a WWE or wrestling. Fan. I've, I mean, I've been to wrestling matches that are like over here, like just like thingy ones when I was a like, kid, like, and like I've, I've like been a fat like yeah. I'm like because this show gave me a new appreciation for not just WWE but wrestling in general. And not I get damn. it, Connor. I get why you like it. It's no, but it's a you say, opera. say it's a storyline. I and easy. you know. It's EastEnders, but fucking it, yeah. interesting. <laughs> um, it's EastEnders, but interesting. Yeah, it is exactly like you just said. It's a soap opera. It's still a dramatic performance at the end of the day. Okay, the question of like if they would call it a like still a sport, and again, it's a it's a form of art. Like it's a cheesy catchphrase on a t-shirt, but it is some sort of art. It's a theatrical performance. Performing war is like, war, man. War, war was war back in nineteen ninety eight. <laughs> Or in the in the late nineties, but um, yeah. Judging by the, like the photos, you know, these two icons, they were the face of the war is war era. But like, I really like to sort of jumping it head into the documentary. Like as the wrestling fan, I am. A lot of the information in it wasn't exactly like new to me or anything I hadn't exactly heard before. But I still like learn an awful bit about the man behind the persona that was Vince. Um, basically the childhood part and the growing up bit and how he even got into the business like that bit it was completely you know intrigued by and that was episode one and two like that's really got me hooked because from episode three onwards i kind of knew how it was gonna like pan out or in terms of the information again but there were still multiple multiple lawsuits that wasn't just mr mcmahon centric that i was glad that got brought up as well yeah, but so yeah, the basic real, yeah, the basic it, premise yeah. of this is it's a look at um, Vince McMahon's life. <clears throat> I believe it was kind of also changed in production because they even say at the beginning, like during the the uh, for recording for some of these interviews, was just before the initial um, sexual assault allegations broke in twenty twenty two. Yeah, early twenty two. Yeah, yeah. So it, it yeah. kind of then shifted gear into a more sort of study of because, you know, wrestlers, you know, that's probably why wrestlers have made good actors. Well, the ones that can do it the best anyway, um, i.e. John mm. Cena. Um, and uh, sorry, Dave <laughs> Batista. Dave Batista is the best actor. The best performer yeah, is Cena. The best like movie star is The Rock. <clears throat> um, other than that, um, yeah, it's it's weird that like you've not had more wrestlers go into movies, but that's a thing for a different time but like it's a it's a more it became more of a study i think of you know where does vince mcmahon end and where does mr mcmahon begin like mm, mm. was it all a character was any of it genuine like sort of thing but instead of it it pondering and walking the line it sort of strays more into the fact of yeah he twisted these things so that you know you blurred the line so you didn't do it even the last episode where I think it's an interview from well early on where it's like, you know, I don't like you sort of then sort of lose like, you know, what was real, what wasn't, you know, am I Mr. McMahon or is, you know, Mr. McMahon me sort of thing. It was like it mm-hmm. sort of become into that and like, you know, it didn't paint him in the best light, which is probably why he's, you know, before it came out, tried to buy it. And a lot of the higher ups towards the end of the yeah. um documentary like the last episode talk about how like you know they just you know you didn't paint vince as a yeah, as a good guy like obviously you know he would have done good things and looked after his employees but there was yeah. stuff we can't ignore in that and which they pushed more on that because the guy who did this is what... the ones that did tiger king aren't they aren't they, they yeah, did tiger king, yeah, story, yeah. i was gonna say like what sort yeah. of thing so they're used to sort of like with that it kind of you know it walks the line a bit of like you know this is all crazy and stuff and like is any of this you know strictly fucking relevant but also you know they painted carol baskin i i believe in more of a you know she's the villain of the piece and it was Mm. even by the um the tile and poster sort of thing on netflix of like you know it's vince pulling the strings is like the poster and the artwork for it 
So it's yeah. so it's yeah, it's interesting. As like I say, for me, like I'm gonna let Connor just rant about WWE, which is something I'm I'm sure he's wanted to do for years. Um <laughs> But as someone who's only previous experience other than like seeing the rock John Cena and Dave Batista in films was like I think I had a Hulk Hogan action figure and there was a kid at my primary school who had an Undertaker lunchbox. That was about it. That was my main experience of wrestling. Of wrestling. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I know because they even talk about that, you know, how some people were like, oh, it's all fake. It's, you know, predetermined and stuff like that. But it, like you say, it is art, it is the performance. So I do appreciate that now. But um, I was just so fucking intrigued by it, man. Like it just grabbed me. Like it's one of those I was watching. I was I watched like the first 15, 20 minutes before I went to work. And I was like, oh, this is, you know, this is OK. Like I'm sort of, you know, seeing, you know, you see bits of him, you see how sort of like he went from just a commentator to becoming the main guy, like the face of wrestling for for a generation. And like when it went, it was when they got into like the WrestleMania three stuff with Andre the giant and things like that. And then it was like a 90,000 people, Hulk Hogan, Silverdome. Yeah. 1987. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like in that, that kit. And then like the fact that, you know, even with that, with the numbers, they sort of like, you know, said there was 93,000 people, but there's other reports that it was 78,000. So there was all, it was all starting to like, the power was starting to get to him and he was building this brand massive, like, you know, and it was taking off. And you get through that, and I was like, fucking hell, this is so intriguing. Like, I don't know whether it it was, you know, it wasn't, like, focused on, say, like, the performances and the results and the storylines as such. It sort of weaved in and out of them in terms of what Vince was involved in, like, when he sort of copied um, Eric Bischoff's thing of, like, being the the bad guy host of it sort of thing, like, being the face, which was, Mm -hmm. you know, everything he did, like they would say, is like, he would do what you were doing, but he would do it better because he was Vince. Like, it was yeah, all those kind of things. It. it was like this, like, this is so fucking interesting. Like, I'm like, I get why, you know, people like this kind of shit. Like, it's amazing. How people in the 90s ate this up, like, persona-wise. Because that's the thing, like, in the, the mid-90s, and as you mentioned in a certain Mr. Eric Bischoff earlier, like, essentially, it goes into the Monday Night Wars with WCW, which was Eric Bischoff's invention, and how... You know, through the mid nineties, they won the rating, like the ratings war for like a good eighty three consecutive weeks. Eighty three consecutive weeks, yeah. So you know, ninety ninety six, ninety five, WWE weren't exactly brilliant, and that's where WCW and Bischoff thrived. And it goes into like I was, I knew Hulk Hogan would be involved because again, he was the face of the eighties. If Hulk, it, it, like like the documentary says, if Hogan wasn't under Vince's belt in WWE, like they would not be around, period. Like Hogan, as much as he is a bit of a meme and a controversial figure himself, um, he, you know, without him, before the days of Stone Cold and The Rock and, you know, you're seen as and everyone else, if it wasn't for Hogan and Vince doing what they did in the 80s, essentially Vince using Hogan as a fucking marketing tool that he inevitably was. It, the wrestling as we know it wouldn't be here like the, the games that we play everything wouldn't be here if it weren't for hogan and vince teaming up but essentially like you said eric bischoff monday night wars da, 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 wcw and everything like i know all about the competition and as i say new, new documentaries and various dvd releases over the years have covered upon this stuff but it was nice to hear again every, it was it was for me it was more just the wrestlers themselves that were like you say the employees were looked after they were in vince's pocket and you know cena the rock triple h obviously triple h is a bit different because he's his he's his um son-in-law but they all say they have like a father and son relationship to vince but then quite honestly they do say like there isn't much of a difference between the persona that you see on screen and the man behind camera like even they you know they could have easily fell under the 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 vince wagon and sort of defended him but like i don't feel like many people again they can't defend him obviously because of everything but they could have easily hushed hush things but i felt people were more honest than i was expecting to hear which was nice for me um but yeah it, it covers things which again i've heard before but it's nice for someone like you to hear how the business was and like you say it covers what vince was involved in but obviously Vince was involved in like every integral event in the history of wrestling, so, like throughout the eighties and nineties, especially. Yeah. Um, well, it's like they it's say, actually, like the, sorry, yeah. it's like they say towards, I think it's either like 
I think it's like towards the end of it, so it might be like episode five or six. So it's like you know, rest like he is one of the most important people ever in the history of wrestling. This guy, oh, like, period. Without, yeah, like, period. You know, you had the you know the stuff in the eighties, the slump in the nineties, the creation of the Attitude Era, and things like that. You know, winning back mm. WCW, buying him out. The fact that you know, yeah. if you fell out with him, he was more likely to bring you back. Like all that kind of shit, yeah. like shit, like how tough he was on his kids, getting his family involved in all that stuff as well, like the affairs and things like that, like storylines. Like I think it's, it's crazy that Linda, his wife, has stuck by him because he didn't say in the interviews like former wife or it, it, as far as I'm aware they're still married. It's crazy, like you know, in my opinion, it's crazy they're still. Oh yeah, it is especially yeah with all that stuff going on. But it's like you've been together yeah. that long. It's like you know, it's one of those. Things. And it was it was more surprising. I think it feels like a complete and interesting documentary and then like it's kind of like the end of like six when they go into like you know you know he cancelled like the rest of his appearances on this after the allegations and it goes more into obviously like it touches on all those things throughout because that's become the through line during when they're making this but it's the Mm. more modern day stuff it's like it then sort of like side angled into like and then all this is happening now and like you know what's going to do about and it's almost like you want more of it you want it to carry on but um so before you watched it um as you are you know <clears throat> the wwe expert in in not the room but in the metaphorical yeah, cyber room COVID, um, i i feel like i've stumbled the last couple of half years but luckily i've got the 2k game sponsored sponsored mm-hmm. games to keep me up to date but yeah um yes sorry yes so I am the what, what so you're pre um pre all this pre mate you can even say pre mm-hmm. the allegations like opinions mm-hmm. on not just wwe but vince himself like what was he to you what was he to me i mean so again without going into the whole history i've only watched like i've only been into wwe since my teens it's not something i grew up with i didn't fortunately get to live through the attitude era and the absolute highs of wrestling like they even say in the documentary like into i can't remember who says it exactly but in terms of like revenue and highest grossing and fan attendance i think was period like 1998 to 2002 which is when 2002 was the year of the lawsuit and WWF had to become WWE because of the World World Wildlife Fund. But essentially, I so I properly tuned in around 2010 time um, and Vince wasn't in the scene around then. And and then you have another character that's a prominent feature in the documentary in the form of Brett the Hitman Hart, who, again, is one of the biggest faces of the 90s. And he, for many, many years, as the documentary reveals about the Montreal screw job, which he, again, I think that's maybe episode four or five. So I won't try and spoil it. And again, for people that know already, you, you again, it's an infamous event in all of wrestling, let alone WWE. But um, yeah, it was around 2010 time that WrestleMania, WrestleMania 26 and Brett returned. And again, he's calling out McMahon, he, you know, McMahon basically brings him back to the company. Brett returns since 1997 because of what went down and, um you know i didn't really get a glimpse of vince mcmahon but obviously i sensed there was beef between the two but again it's knowing what was real life beef and what was storyline beef so i didn't really take much of it at the time um mr mcmahon around the 2010s wasn't really an on-screen authority figure um you know, to, to pun the authority that's more triple h and stephanie mcmahon like he's real life store and his son-in-law they're 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 the face of the man's going forward um but anyway vince himself um again the way he talks to the audience especially in person in a, a great show host like hostman um you know again without thinking and having the foresight of what we now know again times as they say times were different entertainment was different um you know the product around the attitude era is more for like the 18 to 34 aged males so it wasn't as family orientated as wrestling in my day since i've been watching it has been but mcmahon himself yeah there is a, there was a hint of a side to him but i did i just i took it as showman i didn't think anything behind the lines it's more as you learn about stephanie and shane and their upbringing and even them as when they conduct themselves in front of cameras i start to think oh how i started to think in the back of my mind like how would have Vince been like as a father? But of course, this is just regular thoughts as you're watching the product. Um, but McMahon himself around the 2010s wasn't really an on-screen figure. Like he was just essentially the 
well, CFO. He was the owner of WWE for many, many years. But again, as we jump ahead in the documentary, it wasn't until the initial bunch of allegations in 2022, but man had to step away or he got, I think he, yeah, he chose to step away in 2022, which everyone was like, no, no, Vince will be here forever. You know, it's his ride or die. Like, this is his baby. Like, he loves him more than his own family kind of thing. But then he then essentially returns to the company last year. And I think I may have mentioned it many, many podcast episodes ago. Like, I literally said it, it as like, oh, by the way, WWE have been sold. But essentially, McMahon, despite the first initial batch of allegations, came back to the like the the board the chair of board and essentially then sold the company to um along with dana white the owner of ufc to form titan sports like titan sports inc or incorporated or something but essentially like wwe isn't a like a limited private company now it's part of a larger thing um but that was in 2023 and then you know since since the merger with UFC, then that's the thing. The second batch of allegations, which are already fucking terrible, even are now even worse. And even to this day, um, again, it affects a certain wrestler that has refused to comment on any of it, which is obviously not a good thing in any way. But I still find it odd that they've somehow not addressed it, whether it's real or not. But in the form of Brock Lesnar, like still to this yeah. day, like he was involved in this alleged stuff and. You know, Brock Lesnar hasn't been seen, I feel, since since the art. I like basically like, yeah, Jan 2014, uh, 2024, not 2014, Jesus, um, 2024. But, you know, it, yeah, the man, the man anyway, from what I knew of him, I wouldn't say much of him, but it's more than going back, playing again, playing the TH, THQ games, going through the Attitude Era for the first time, getting the DVDs as I have. And sort of getting a glimpse of how the era was back then and the doc and the product itself, you do get to that point of, oh, is this real or is he just playing a great character? And he says himself that there is no distinction between him and the character. But then that's it's funny how everyone else in these clips interviews say otherwise. And it wasn't apart from I think Bruce Pitt, uh, Bruce Pritchard, who again was another figure in the WWE sort of creative board he says around seven or eight like he's the only one that sort of is in in McMahon's corner kind of like I got the impression of at the end and he's like no no like Vince isn't a terrible person yeah but everyone else in this documentary and again it covers all eras like even um uh Terry Belia's Hulk Hogan um Tony Atlas who again is a wrestler I knew from the 80s I know the name but I don't know that guy at all as a like as an off-screen character but the fact that he said some honest things about how his time was in the WWE like in the 80s and Vince in general like again it just it started to the dots start to click and like you say it's just it is an intriguing fucking documentary it just even though I felt like I heard it some of it before like you I just wanted more <laughs> just it's like you want. sort of heard it in like a new light in new context sort of thing absolutely but then a lot of the footage they've shown yeah sure i've seen it plenty of times over but again it's just having the foresight that we now have and yeah cancel culture is a thing guys and it can happen to anyone at any minute from the sounds of it but like when it happens to people that kind of deserve it and again it's now if if i was to go on the wwe network and go back to the the good old days of vince and you know just wwf in general sure it's going to be tainted it's going to be fucking weird and knowing that yeah the product was trying to be edgy at the time and you know trying to break the barriers and ultimately try to beat their competition but knowing McMahon's limits, and again, I, I'm not trying to advocate for him at all, but unless he has like an undiagnosed sort of mental illness, in the fact that he's like, there isn't anything different in me, like that's just me. And they, the interviewers like question him in some of the clips, but he's like, no, 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 that's not true. And then you get clips of the other people in, in the documentary, and they're like, no, it's the opposite. Like, does yeah. he really well, have quite old, a side, he? or does he just view it as one thing? Yet clearly, it isn't. Like, it's it's, it's crazy. I don't understand the logic yeah. of it, but I suppose that's the whole point. We're not supposed to understand. Oh, yeah, he can go through what he's gone through. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, like, you know, and you can't like disparage the fact that like the man worked hard and like built a brand and built one of the biggest brands, not just you know in that sport, but in terms of entertainment as a whole. You can't argue that WWE yeah. has been absolutely massive it's you know <laughs> um i like that in his interview like on like at the time 
like as in like modern day he was kind of like oh like we're completely different but then there's an interview like from before that and he's sort of like no we can't you know it's you know is the character me or am i the character sort of thing like blurring the lines it's kind of like you know sometimes you believe your own backstory so much because you keep telling yourself it's like when um i don't remember it was a podcast <laughs> thing that it was like ages ago it's like if you tell yourself something enough like over the years like you know i i you know i first ate like a pizza because of like so and so like you and then it will always change a bit and it will become the point where like you don't actually remember the original you know anecdote you know yeah. thing that that anecdote comes from like you end up you know believing what you've heard either from yourself or from other people because you've told it so much or had it's it been told to you you'll Chinese never fully whispers. remember the truth yeah yeah it, it's word of mouth it's yeah exactly um but as i say to back that yeah. up it isn't mentioned in the documentary undertaker 1999 ministry of darkness he became that in character so much that even other people off camera were and even him in public he would not distinguish himself as mark calloway or as the undertaker like he really became the lord of darkness like off camera and you know did some awkward stuff at that time again it wasn't a thing in the documentary it's just something that i knew at the time but that led to a brief situation for him in the late 90s where he almost had to quit the company he had to he basically got you know he chose he, on screen he basically was like you know what sod you vince i'm going but that was a segment that was that wasn't him being real that was just the how they wrote him off tv but then that did lead you know for a brief period in the late 90s like he was an undertaker as well in the history of wrestling is one of the best the greats he's one of the goats and i'm not suggesting that mark again god forbid anything bad comes out of him because he seems like one of the most down to earth like people performers in all of wrestling but there was a time in 1999 where like you just say once you begin that once you believe you're something and again your craft and dedication it will it will you know overthrow all other senses and priorities like if you believe in something you can get consumed by it and you will become your thing um but, but yeah, that led to the whole American badass thing. And yeah, this is not Undertaker. So that's a whole other separate discussion. But um, yeah, it's essentially backing what you're saying. Like once you believe something and you know, your will and you, know, you don't know yourself how far you're going with it. But then Vince, Vince was a fucking genius. But for me, it was more about Vince McMahon Sr. And again, how he, how he started off in the business and essentially how vince mcmahon jr had the confidence to buy the business from his own dad but then they still had to be in the business together but then you know not having the tough love sense of oh like you know well done or not having the official like father and son relationship like people probably did look at them as a parent like oh like that's not a good family diet like family relationship vince in the interviews like you know rightfully wrongfully is all subjective but he he reckons his father loved him but all they had a good enough relationship but he did say like he had to sort of work to get the love from his dad and you know, there's instances where he sort of admits to it but it's only once or twice to get love from you know his dad but it's just for me that was more the the crazy part i didn't know how young okay, so how the young vince got into the business i didn't know he was born into it i didn't really i wasn't really aware of mr mcmahon senior because when you when you hear about vince on tv it's always mr mcmahon it's ne he's never been introduced as mr mcmahon junior it's always been vince so i just assumed he was the man from the get-go but mm. yeah it's the early stuff that really well, i guess just yeah, intrigued me but that's more episode one two stuff um but yeah, um, yeah, that was oh, I'm going with that. But yeah, episode one and two, that's the good stuff. Early Vince before he became who he became, so to speak. But no, yeah, I really did. Um, I really did fuck with it, man. It was it was good stuff. Like it was just so like this is bonkers. Like you know, the storylines of like his you know his kids as well. Like the fact that you know obviously like he had that tough love stuff with his father, and that's you know probably why he was as harsh on fucking shane as he was kind of thing it was you know it's shane. all of the break yeah. the cycle thing isn't it like you know mm. your, your father's shane out of all shane out of all of them is probably the most sincere man as well but he again like the documentary alludes to like he originally thought he was going to get the, so inherit the business from his dad and us and you know without jumping into foresight but that isn't how it panned out for him a shane I don't think, well, I, I mean, it could be wrong. I think they said he might still be employed by WWE, but he's now more of a backseat, like, creative figure, like, 
one of the the chairman of boards. Like he's not an on screen persona that. He's, he, no, he's best known for his ten years of WWE. So no, I don't think he's even in the company now, Shane. But yeah, he's not. Yeah, yeah there's a sort of thing that he's kind of like it's it. It doesn't seem to be under contract by WWE at this point in time. Yeah, because obviously, like yeah. you say, like um, Vince resigned, or like as many people believe, he jumped before he was pushed, sort of thing in 22 mm. because the allegations were starting to come forward. And um, at that point, of like from what it looks like, I mean, you can tell me more firsthand because you watched it when it actually happened. But like the first WrestleMania after Vince was apparently some of the best yeah. numbers since the Attitude Era. Yeah, well, it, it was so I think WrestleMania 39, which is the 2023 WrestleMania, I think might have been the first one. Essentially, WrestleMania has been a one night show on Sunday since WrestleMania one. But then the two night show format has only been a thing since COVID. So WrestleMania was always a Sunday one night event around March, early April time, uh, always on Sunday, but then essentially you know, pre COVID post COVID the, the business had to adjust and they've always done like night one and night two events. So it'd be on the Saturday and the Sunday, but like you say, I think so the 2023 edition of WrestleMania, WrestleMania 39 was a, no, it wasn't the first two night one, but uh, yeah, I think you're right. It, it did do crazy numbers. I mean, whether or not it's to do with again because of what was going on in real life and the fact that it was kind of like, oh my god, Vince is not in the company. Oh, who's gonna obviously, yeah, you, know, you think it was an element of that? But... Like, you know, whenever there's a big change to something like a TV show, for example, like you know, to use our old friend, like whenever there's an like a, a doctor's first episode, more of the general audience will sort of be like, oh, f well, like they're not involved or like this person's involved now. So like, was it maybe no, a thing of like, I, what I'm is incorrect. It wasn't, it wasn't last year's WrestleMania. Sorry, I, I've just got it up. So essentially, yeah, WrestleMania it's like 39, the 2023 edition. Um, It was, it just said this would sub sub subsequently be the final WrestleMania in which WWE was still owned and controlled by the McMahon family as on April the 3rd, the day after the event. So yeah, it was April. So the day after WrestleMania in 2020, that's when the company got sold that's when you know, allegedly vince came back and sold the rights to endeavor and form sorry not titan sports ignore yeah. me, but endeavor where but, wwe and usc joined or joint aligned with this endeavor company so that so yeah. that was basically april 23 is when they got sold but it's basically wrestlemania this year wrestlemania 40 that's again the big numbers and i and again whether that's down to icons like The Rock coming back, it's John Cena or the various stars and performers. And I think, bearing in mind, I think Triple H and Stephanie, like together, I think had both done shows like prior to this year's WrestleMania being like the first McMahon, non McMahon led WrestleMania. Um, but no, I, I thought it was last year, but essentially it was this year. And you're right, it definitely did do fucking well with numbers. And again, it was a brilliant, brilliant two night event. Um, but that might just be more down to the year long storyline that started with WrestleMania 39 with Ro Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes. Again, I won't go into that because that's a fucking story and a half that will take you all throughout COVID. But no, essentially, it could be for any reasons. But you're right. Like the first Vin without Vince, the first WrestleMania without Vince, of course, that would have more eyes on the product than ever because it yeah. was his baby. Well, in um, terms of like yeah because yeah. like because from the documentary does like the 23 one which was the first one that was fronted by you know triple h and stephanie like with what it's like you know it's this generation now and it seemed like it was going to be a yeah. thing of like in good hands but obviously she resigned then when he came back not long after yeah. and then obviously it's been sold and now he's then no longer again involved in it in any capacity so we'll see kind of the proper effect of that it you know through 25 and like what that looks like as a you know the actual first full year without vince involved in any capacity whatsoever because also him coming yeah. back they talk about how then being part of the subsidiary it's not like vince mm -hmm. has outright total control anymore so it's then he's a piece in a in a bigger pu puzzle so, so to speak so it, it'll be interesting and to in, see what then, yeah, it looks like now. Then removed him, didn't they? And that board, the, the the Endeavor board, then removed him as well because of everything. Yeah. So, yeah. So who is in charge uh, right now? Triple H, as far as I'm aware, he Triple H the game, his son-in-law. Um, yeah, no. So Stephanie, like you say, isn't with 
Stephanie. Paul. All right, I'm going to expose him. The man known as Paul Levesque, the game, Triple H. -er. Yeah, he is the current chief content officer and head of creative for WWE, a subsidiary of TKO Group Holdings. Um, so I was right with TKO. I don't know. Where, I don't know why I didn't have that in my mouth earlier. But TKO. So essentially, who is in charge of TKO? Um, founded by Ari Emanuel and Vince McMahon. Jesus. Okay. Well, that ain't happening. So essentially, it's this Ari Emanuel, I suppose, who is the head of TKO slash Endeavor, the TKO Group. I'm guessing they, so he's essentially the man, the CEO and executive chairman of um, TKO. So he's the guy that's above UFC and WWE. So he's the mm -hmm. head, head, head on show. But whether or not so, he will ever yeah. be a figure on WWE television, you know, who knows? But I doubt, I, I assume he'd just be like a, you know, a, a silent sort of uh, leader kind of thing. Yeah. So Triple H is in charge of the storylines. Certainly um, on screen as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh well, yeah so stephanie obviously resigned when he came back which then says a lot of like you know was he she the one that sort of like were <laughs> like tried to get him to leave the first time sort of thing like in terms of like you know yeah. leave while you still got a bit of dignity and then he's come back and obviously there's more of these allegations so it's a thing of like you know this can't like even they say in the documentary like this can't be a family business anymore because it's too it's mm. too big like you you need too someone attached. at the head of it who's got a business brain to control these kind of things um mm. it's just it's just really interesting to sort of like know all those things like now obviously like in whatever capacity you'll never have 100 percent of the truth because we were never there sort of thing you know no, things can be edited or put in a certain way we're not saying they are but obviously there is stuff to be said there because um you know the, everyone's got conflicting like things with this man but clearly stuff has happened because he wouldn't be paying that amount of hush money like to certain yeah. people over certain periods of time well like i almost like it's you know he does and i get like he didn't want to let go of it because he made it what it was and like without him like him he is so synonymous with it like there is not one without the other there is no mr mcmahon without wwe and there is no wwe without mr mcmahon sort of thing absolutely yeah but, like, absolutely it's just like how like this was able to go on and like like you say such a product of the time especially the 80s and 90s into early 2000s stuff like it's it's wild compared to what it is now like in terms of absolutely like, yeah in terms of what they do well, no, like, wrestling will probably never be that ever again that's the thing it probably will never get to that absolute peak but I mean, I'm not confirming ratings are at an all time breaking high now, but uh, even in interviews with like, re like I've listened to a couple of podcasts that again, not WWE related as such, but he interviews wrestlers like in and out of WWE company, like AEW and all sorts of wrestling promotions. But another figure that was briefly in the documentary, uh, Cody Rhodes, like who's essentially is like the world champion at the minute. Even he said, like, or confirmed like, revenue merchandise at an all-time high um you know the wrestlemania obviously did amazingly well the company is doing all sorts of trends at the minute that haven't been seen for various years i don't know as high as the attitude era so to speak but you know wwe as far as i'm concerned and as far as revenue and and you know interest and you know percentages and interest it's all it's through the roof like everything is skyrocketing whatever the tko group the tko group are doing it's working as a business and they are kind of thriving and I, that goes to tell with the wwe network and the amount of shows they're doing they're, they're, they're they've been doing international shows this year like whereas their shows are basically in america um you know they have a partnership with saudi arabia and that's been the thing since 2018 i want to say um, you know, this year there was a pay per view and events in Germany and France, so they are definitely putting on and spending a lot more revenue than and you know, money to do more worldwide affairs than they've had in various years. Perhaps in terms of inflation and economic money figures, it's probably not as high as the attitude figures, but you know, they are in their way getting close to it. I imagine. Give it a couple of years time, who knows where the business and the industry will be at. Um, but yeah, so everything is going right according to them, anyway. Um, yeah, so like that's just you know, it's just so interesting. So, were you sort of changed on anything having seen it all afterwards? 
it just I, I mean i've wanted to kind of i've done most of the archie era um i've sort of been slowly watching it over the last couple of years really um to get like a full-on understanding of what we yeah, what essentially happened and again the, the games various documentaries over the years have sort of told me things so it, again it's not things i've not he heard before but <clears throat> one thing that i guess again i could have done more in my spare time but wcw the monday night wars i've heard and seen documentaries i've seen enough interviews i've seen enough things but to actually sit there and watch the competition before it then got shit and sold out um um you know wcw and even ecw briefly like that's a, it just it's those areas that i need to fulfill as a fan in me again if i was watching it from when i was a wee little lad then you know i probably would have done it growing up and that would be old news to me but um in terms of what's changed it, it would just be going back and watching wwe at its peak because as amazing as it was and entertaining and as questionable as it is at the time like it won't be the same <laughs> it really won't be the same um another key character that i kind of knew about the time and she, again she was abused and again disgustingly treated on screen is sable um this brock lesnar's former well, well i think they're still married brock lesnar's wife who were then basically again going into the whole you know if you if vince was to fire you you'd more then come back into the business like she sable had a lawsuit against vince in the late 90s i believe again partly due to how she was on screen and then she ended up coming back to the company around 2002 2003 time and that's when you lot you see a lot of the crude and more sexual side and the, again the very questionable stuff nowadays but despite the real life beef they had you you know you as the someone that was in suing that company and suing that man for what how they treated you on screen again to question sable why would you even go back into that man's arms like not literally but figuratively in the company like why would you even go back there yeah all that all that stuff's kind of questionable isn't it like you just sort of think what what is it is it just purely for the money is it something deeper than that but um, yeah, like, who yeah, surprised yeah. you in terms of the fact that they were involved or said something on it, like whether it be like you know wrestlers or like anyone behind the scenes? Um, I mean, again, I was more. I knew Hogan had to say a lot because essentially, if it weren't for Vince, Hogan wouldn't be who he is anyway. Um, but in terms of surprises, um, I, even Cena. Cena saying some of the stuff he said because I mean that was again as the company was no longer attitude and no longer adult and the lawsuits so they then had to drop the f and become the e in wwe um and again going into his right as opposed to john cena and him saying again because i think he was one of the first to say oh yeah like father son relationship and it was followed by i think the rock stone cold um you know i don't think hogan never said a father son relationship but that's when in that whatever episode that was everyone sort of states how close they are to him and very much they could be in vince's pocket but I, I got the impression they were just trying to be as honest as they were or as they can um i did yeah surprise um heck bischoff because again his competition in the 90s um again he's always been around for these other documentaries and monday night war related stuff but you know, bischoff was surprisingly honest as well so i don't know really like senior and bischoff i guess <laughs> were surprising even considering the fact that he brought bischoff back as the general manager of raw yeah um again yeah nothing dodgy in that i think that was just purely a a, dis a business like showman business thing oh look yeah. let's get this authority heel figure that everyone hated in the 90s let's get him back and shake things up yeah like, yeah i mean i get i understand that from a business point of view like yeah eric bischoff was a key key oh yeah that would yeah mm. do it for the views and also it would be it's like also a big like you know fuck you i'm in charge kind of thing as well yeah it will be back as one of my many many pawns yeah exactly yeah um, like yeah. i own everyone sort of thing yeah especially yeah, it's, you yeah. It, it's a it's a yeah i enjoyed it a lot i'm, I'm very insightful very eye-opening <coughs> we will kind of maybe if anything comes up at least we can kind of discuss it because i'd be in, like if we get any progress on what's happening with him Maybe yeah, we can uh, actually uh, keep on top of this. But what we can't keep on top of, apparently, is watching uh, Indiana Jones, Connor. Damn, that's what I was... I literally was going to change the picture. 
<laughs> I found that out to, like literally probably an hour an hour ago. <laughs> oh, damn it! That's well, going to be my hot scoop of the day. But yeah, well, Ryan, you've said it. <laughs> well, no, because you were saying about like you know if you want to spend an evening with Indiana Jones. So what is what is the issue? Well, worldwide, as of today, I mean, it might be different time zones and stuff, but I read from this article today, all the Steven Spielberg-led films, so anything pre-Dial pre of Destiny, is removed worldwide in all of Disney+. Plus. They no longer exist, and there's no reason as to why. You can't watch them anymore on Disney+. Strange. And I but find that, that disgusting. The only thing that that's kind of happened with before has been stuff that's not solely owned by disney like i know that some of the spider-man stuff was on there for a bit and then came off obviously any time that they've I mean, had anything to do badly they've taken off of there spectacular spider-man i think is one of those few spider-man things that's still off of disney plus i don't think they've sorted that one out i think that's still removed and that was a while ago yeah but that's stuff that's not completely under their license so like i kind of you know yeah. there is you know conflicting things there but like with indiana jones like they own lucasfilm all this that's like removing some of the star wars films that's like taking the uh, original yeah. trilogy off well who's to say they're not going to be next for whatever reason um yeah i say no reasons or anything as felt as to why it was just kind of like a dun, 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 breaking news you can't watch them anymore like not that again this can be this important i'm gonna have to get the 4k set sooner rather than later because of reasons like this um yeah, I'm just glad I didn't choose like this week to do an Indiana Jones rewatch because fair enough, I could do Raiders, Temple of Doom, <gasps> no last crusade, and uh, yeah, that would annoy me. Um, yeah, so yeah, FYI, again, three days later by the time this comes out, but yeah, Indiana Jones, no more on Disney Plus, unless it's the amazing Oscar nominated 2023 movie that definitely went down well with like a ton of bricks. Um, the Dial Destiny. Yeah, that is, it's it's stupid. It's like you say, it's why we still champion physical media. Um, so buy physical media where you can. Have media libraries of all shapes and sizes. Like I've got a friend like at work who collects laser discs now. Like he's oh, yes. he's got some uh, got some cool ones in his collection. And that just started off as a like he'd got hold of a couple and then was like, oh, I'm gonna get a few more. But then obviously there's only a certain run of that because they stopped producing those in 2001. So. Like, oh, God, but there's some, there's some good ones time. in there, man. There's some, uh, you know, collect physical media. Just do it. You know, it's like a modern day, you know, library. People used to just fucking have loads of books. Now we have Blu-rays and 4Ks. So, and there's no, and there's no going back. No. And that's, that's but do you know, what, do you know, what you might have to add to your old, um, your old physical media collection, Connor. In anticipation need, for maybe a return. Of Sherlock, maybe you might have to get the other four seasons. Which it's only season one's on 4K, like as in what do you mean? <laughs> they all come out I'd watch Sherlock you because they might make more. That apparently Sue Virtue, um, not just this isn't just her only thing, but she's also Stephen Moffat's wife. Um, but like you know, legendary producer at the BBC, like you know, she's you know been such a part of anything really that uh, Moffat has done that's not Doctor Who I don't think she was involved in Doctor Who at all when um, he was showrunner or before that or whatever but like you know in terms of the stuff they do together so like Sherlock I think um, she was involved in Dracula and other other ones of his shows like that um, said that there you know there is always a chance of that returning and that might be sooner rather than later because I know that they were talking about writing multiple seasons back to back at one point um but they obviously the main thing is the cast availability because they are all rather famous um and the fact that also um you know series four was probably not as well received as others because i think i sort of have that problem i know that um andy's a big moffat fan and you know would not have any sort of moffat slander but um mm -hmm. i think sherlock did jump up its own ass very fucking vividly like because i did rewatch it not that long ago and you can't get away from the magic of like those first two like i think series two is just peak of that show and then it's like yeah. oh we've got to continue being sexy and appeal to the tumblr generation and then it's sort of like oh i'm being too clever and i'm inverted and then there's a girl on an airplane but it's his sister oh i've just fallen over with shock 
Um, but yeah, coming back to that now, that would be interesting. It's also one of those shows that I think it's not like coming back to Gavin and Stacey 10 years later where you're like, it's never going to be as good as you imagine it. There is so much Arthur and Conan Doyle stories to adapt that like you can sort of have it be this anthology thing that like it was, it was what, like three episodes every two years. And then obviously you had a bit of a gap for series four and then to come back to it now, like seven, eight, nine, ten years later. I mean, it's believable. It wouldn't, I don't think you could then do it to the stand it was before. Like, I don't know if you'd have time to get Benedict Cumberbatch and Martin Freeman to do it every two years for, for a little while. But, um, I'd take at least one more out of it just to sort of, if they could wrap it up, mm-hmm. I would take that. I mean, fingers crossed. I mean, it will give me more time to um, certainly <laughs> continue with it because I did season one a couple of weeks ago. And again, I haven't had, I just haven't had the urge or time to carry on with season two. But no, I, 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 I want to see, I feel like, like you say, I've seen the highs and then how it's going to get worse. I'll just have to wait and see. Um, but Sherlock, I want to do. I want to finish. I'll. I hope that it will make a comeback because that will feel like an event when it does. And I think event series, limited series. Like I hate that word, limited series. But events slash series where you're talking films or you know shows that have been off the air and suddenly making a, an appearance, which feels like an event. I feel like they 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 all tend to do well, not just with viewers and from a business point of view and airs and figures, but. I just, hopefully it's a better quality. If it's like you say, if it's one than done and it's a really good send off, then happy, happy days. I hope just if they were to do an inevitable season one day, um, I hope then that doesn't leave down the rabbit hole of, oh, look, it did way more than we were expecting as a business. We need to do another one to ride the momentum. No, that, have that your is momentum the, and go yeah. out in the sunset. Go out in the, the problem, on your nice sunset. Mm. That something does yeah. well and then it's like the, but it makes us money. So let's keep doing it. Whereas we need it, uh, it's also the thing of you know, know when enough's enough, yeah. Yeah, which I think you know, as much as we you know, we joke about it, at least Gavin and Stacey is coming back for the final episode. Like, this is it, it's the this is wrapping up 17 years worth of stuff. Yes, it will never be as good as it was then, and sometimes when you know immediately after we get it is when we want more of it and having too much of a gap can just it can because considering like you know how negative some people can be about like you know doctor who star wars the mcu like Im- like imagine just going back into that fucking firing line of like you know you're putting yourself in a place where you know people are going to have imagined 10 times better stories in their head for the last you know, seven, eight years, are you going to live up to any of that? And the reality of that is no. Like, no one can tell a better story than the ultimate fans, like, head. So it's going to, it's one of, it's those kind of shows that, like, you know, they struggle, they'll either not be as popular or it will generate such an interest that, like you say, people will be like, oh, well, we could do more of this, where it should be like, no, 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 we should end it here. Like, it should be the full stop, not the, you know, not the beginning of a new sentence. It should be the end of the book. Yeah. Yeah. No bookmarks. Like, gone. If they're going to make any more pages, tear it out. Pretend it never happened. Erase it. <laughs> but that is uh, for another day. Um, Not really much else has happened, has it, really? Um, I mean, again, just, just I, I'm just sort of scrolling just to see if things come. But things I did send you... Um, just again, going by the headline, I haven't really read into it, but Marvel and DC have technically lost the use of the word. I'm guessing it's just the word of superhero. Um, they're both, yeah, Marvel and DC both have lost their long held joint trademark for the term of superhero, which had previously allowed them to control its usage and protect their branding. Case argued superhero was a generic term that didn't deserve trademark protection. This change now opens up the term for others, like as in other companies, to use without needing permission. 
Um, so as a result of this, creators and companies can now freely use the words superhero in their works, potentially increasing competition in the superhero genre and leading to its broader use across different media platforms. So in other words, we're going to get a lot li uh, not just live action. We're going to get a whole multiverse instead in our, of the, just in our universe of more superhero content, because in an industry that is led by the Marvel you know, MCU box office success, and it's inevitable long-term storytelling <laughs> with the superhero term being no longer t held down or tied, so to speak. We're going to get a whole load of movies that claim to be part of the superhero conversation, but whether or not there will be imposter movies or, you know, there, there might be an odd gem here to come in the future. But um, I thought that was just an intriguing headline, but the, the superhero thing is no longer trademarked and protected by the superheroes two. are dead. Long live superheroes. Well, yeah, it's long now live Super Zeros. We're going to see some really generic B movies come into play because it's now it's it the worst superhero public domain. Require some uh, creative choices because if like independent uh, uh, productions and studios are going to start, you know, because they can just you, do their own stuff, then maybe we can get some uh, like real creative, uh, you know, freshness to the to the brand of superheroes, and maybe it might make Marvel think, oh, we, you know. Have to kind of up our game a bit here, and not just it uh, be more like this. Yeah, chug yeah. along. Yeah, yeah. Be more creatively free in terms of like, like what Marvel wanted to do and claim they did um, after second Edgar Wright, when it was like, no, we, you, you know, the person comes in and puts their touch on it. Like, you know, you, you let Taika Waititi come in and do his taste of this, <laughs> and then after Love and Thunder, they're like, maybe not. Um, let there be, let it be something else. That has superheroes in it, like you know, maybe it will lead to some more of those kind of conversations, or maybe it would, like it will lead to fuck all anyway, because everyone is a you know is a slave to capitalism, and we're all just going to watch what we're told to watch. Yeah, but because I'm the free man and, and I'm no longer held down by the system, come and watch my superhero movie? Question quotation question mark. Like I don't know yeah. whether or not people just use it, and then you go into it and go, well, there was nothing superhero about it whatsoever, so. Yeah, it might just lead to more generic shit. Or again, you might break through the mold, you know, the 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 mainstream competition as we keep slagging off. Well, I feel like we keep slagging off. Yeah, as they know, it clearly isn't getting through to all of the audiences and fans. So it might take a creative inventor to come along the next, well, <laughs> couple of years at least, hopefully. Um again, it doesn't say how long, like it's just free for now until someone inevitably buys the trademark rights of superhero, but Hopefully, sooner rather than later, we'll get a resurgence, a breath of fresh air, and it will make the mainstream kick themselves in the gut and think, fuck, we need our movies to be more like Superhero Nanny, the the something, something, free use movie here, or whatever the <laughs> next breakthrough thing is going to be. But yeah, I just thought that one was funny. Um, I'm just sort of quoting what I send you. Um, Shawshank Redemption, again, not uh, another... Again, it's nothing to do with superheroes now, but Shawshank Redemption director Frank Darabont, I'll call him Frank Paramount, um, Frank Darabont, I'm totally butchering his fucking name, he's come out of retirement um, to do Stranger Things Season 5 episodes. Well, that'll be interesting. When's that meant to drop? Is that early next year? I mean, if it loads. I think they are, it is meant to be a next year release um, in general. But um, Frank Darabont, Anyway, acclaimed director. I mean, Shawshank Redemption, if you're talking just movies in general, is one of the most critically acclaimed. IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, da -da -da -da, you know, book adaptations. It's one of the highest acclaimed movies in the history of films. Um, I get, I, I, nothing's working now in terms of pulling evidence up. But Frank Darabont hasn't been around, at least behind the camera, or even written anything for years. But so the fact that he's coming back to do Stranger Things, I feel like... Again, like Mr. McMahon, it will put more eyes on the product in theory. Um, yeah, it's a nice little like, way to sort of bring it back around again, isn't it? But, um, yeah, well, there'll be uh, more stuff because I believe at some point in the next week or so, we'll end up talking about Joker Folle Adieu. Uh, I'm Folly psycho Adieu. with Harley Quinn, Lady Gaga. Uh, I probably get killed anyway. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, oh, um, oh, you uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> um, a cliffhanger for this week's episode. It, it might be, yeah. Um, 
I mean, we're getting to the point now where in real life, you know, it's October now. You know, we're going to have to oh, well, start executing our Christmas, really execute Christmas 66, and we'll have to um, oh, be preparing for the, as we wind down for the festive season. So um, oh, I know we, we've got some stuff to record with Andy in terms of our actual Christmas special and then talk about the Doctor Who Christmas special. We've got some spum mm. to come with our spum chum, Mike. Um, oh, good old spum. Things. Um, but what are you guys uh, looking forward to? Have you guys seen Joker yet? Um, I don't really care if you have, but fuck it, tell us, because we might as well listen to you. Um, and, um, yeah, any good documentary recommendations? Maybe that, like, you know, not yeah, just, I mean, you know, I'm going to watch the whole world was revolving around this monsters documentary. Sorry, but as soon as I heard this McMahon documentary, we still had a bit of a stealth release. I mean, because I've this documentary project I'd, I'd been reading about for months and months anyway, but I was sort of typical that it came out the same week as I mean, is it hostels about the two brothers that killed the I mean, the names escape me, but no, so it's like, it's more, yeah, it's more yeah. like a drama, a like a dramatization of it. So it's um, by the same people that did the um, the bloody uh, the Dharma series with um, what's yes, his face? Yes, 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 Quicksilver. Uh, so quick, it, quick now, Peters, I don't yeah. know if you ever sort of you know. You've you've watched American Horror Story, haven't you? Uh, yes, yeah, well, like little bits, yes, yeah. not for long seasons, ever... but I have seen various bits. Yeah. yeah, did you ever get into American Crime Story? No, I did a nasty OJ's like People versus OJ Simpson, isn't it? And then season two yeah. is about something else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the assassination of uh, Gianni Versace, and then there was meant to be a third season, I think, based on um, Bill Clinton and his affair. Where I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Um, I think oh, there was nice. going to be something like that, and that never materialised. And this kind of is almost pseudo like that, but with mass murderers. So, like, it's the same oh, sort nice. of people. Um, and there is a third season um, being planned. And Charlie Hunnam is—I forget the um, the real life criminal he will be portraying, but it's a guy that, as far as I know, like kidnapped like loads of women in the woods or something. But um, we can read more into that right. as it goes. Give give uh, monsters a go. Um, you will be shocked yep. by it because there's. There's a lot in it, like in terms of obviously, like you know, from what it's based off of. If you see side by side comparisons with some of the cult stuff and things like that, it is quite um, shocking. But um, there is also the fact that the person, I think it's Ryan Murphy that wrote it, um, like didn't yes. speak to the brothers at all. So it wasn't like a thing of like lots of in depth research and then making it. It's kind of from what he's, you know, from what he's gathered himself in terms of from the actual source and then done that, which I know is either annoyed or you know, some people have you know enjoyed it either way so we're um we'll see on that and but it is, has led to a lot is, of people isn't there a, it's not to, sorry not to in, interrupt right. you off but someone at work was saying um isn't there an actual documentary in the vein of the like the actual brothers speaking about their crimes allegedly and they're coming I, forward i believe there is and with that and with this it has led to a lot of people thinking that there should be a retrial of the brothers because in terms of like right. the things that you come out and you learn about them in terms of their actual private life and why they did what they did, what they that did. Um, yeah. there is stuff that, you know, that clearly would affect anyone, let alone them. And um, that kind of stuff was not allowed to be used as evidence kind of thing. So it kind of, they, um, it's weird because it was like, it was like early nineties. So it's like, you know, they were sending them down for that, but not, very, like you're not surprised that it's happened it's kind of like a you know it's hard to explain if you watch it i'll try and stay awake for the rest of it and then maybe we'll talk about that next week and sort of see yeah um, nice. okay what you think on that sounds good but yeah lead us out connor where can the people find us well youtube congrats um <laughs> maybe one day stream yard if it isn't a, a website maybe it has a own separate app you can follow us on stream yard um you know facebook x instagram not whatsapp that's a bit too personal for our liking um you know if there's dodgy myspace sites if there's really funny links they'll be in the links down below you can send us an email you can send us your documentary suggestions or tell us what wrestling matches George needs to watch that aren't Vince McMahon <laughs> involved that just are a really good time. You can send them to uh, nerdbiblecontact at gmail.com um, for all that good, goodness, goodness stuff. <laughs> goodness stuff? Oh, broken English. Um, but yeah, I've been Vince. He's been Stone Cold. 
if you don't hit the subscribe button, like this video, share it with your friends, and even dare to put a comment down below, you're all fired. <laughs> you missed the perfect opportunity. You got to subscribe as, because Stone Cold said so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're all fired. Austin 316. Yeah, big up Austin 316. Always. Even it ain't yeah. March the 16th. Damn it. Or the third of the 16th month that doesn't exist. Or if Until it's not it does quarter past. Or if it's not just gone quarter past three where you are. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> uh...